Dr. Gerald Allen is research professor at the University of New Mexico, senior research fellow for the IC Institute at the University of Texas at Austin, and professor emeritus of marketing at the University of Oregon. Dr. Allen is a former director for the Academy and a member of the editorial review board. Jerry, it's great to have you with us here today. And I'd like to ask you what spurred your interest in the marketing discipline? Interestingly, it was a teacher I had at the University of Washington during my MBA, who I never took a class from. And his name was Newell Comish, Jr. His father had been a big name in retailing for, uh, I think, years before. And then young Newell came along, and somehow we got to talking, and he encouraged me to go on for the PhD in marketing. Normally, I had been interested in international business primarily, but so that was it. I mean, just but basically one person influenced me. What do you feel that you're most proud of in your academic uh, career? I'd say it's probably the careers of my doctoral students. And I've had about 15 to 20 somewhere in there that I supervised. I think that's been the one thing. I mean, you know, you always have the same kind of thing about your research, and you do an article here, and, you know, gee, we got a JMR, let's just go on. And, but I think it's probably been my doctoral students. And you've maintained long-term relationships with, with some them. of them. The others have, you know, kind of, uh, they're off doing their own thing. But, uh, and I was fortunate here, for instance, uh, Two of my doctoral students are here on the program, so. Thanks, and what contributed most to your career success? Hard work, good colleagues, and the ability or the opportunity to network with other people, both in the United States and abroad. And I think this, probably the networking would have been if you had to single one out, I mean, other than hard work, but uh, it would have been the networking and the fact that I had created a lot of good networks. I've worked with a lot of people overseas as well as here within the U.S. What aspect of the networking and uh, in, in what do you think you really gained from, from meeting so many okay. people? And there hasn't been, that I can think of, a single joint project with anybody that I haven't learned something new about. And it comes from them or it comes from the kind of project. And I find that to be, uh, I think, one of the key factors in there. Uh, what role has the Academy of Marketing and Science played in your career development over the years? Well, actually, I would, I would say the one single thing, if you had to do it, was the opportunity to to network internationally. I mean, I've uh, been fortunate in the academy. I'm probably one of the oldest members around. Maybe I won't use the word oldest, seasoned <laughs> members around. Uh, still, I mean, maybe Harold, certainly Harold's been in longer than I have, but, uh, and I've been program chair twice, both overseas, one in Copenhagen, one in Hong Kong and track chair the usual number of times. So, but it's been that ability to expand the network, you know, particularly through the international programs that I think, you know, the academy's helped. Uh, I haven't been an officer in the academy, so I, I haven't really gone that route or even tried to do that route. So, uh, and, and I remember when the academy was first formed, and it was the idea that here was the mechanism by which we marketing scholars could sort of get together, network with each other, uh, because at that time the academics were kind of playing second fiddle in the AMA, and uh, you know, be behind the business group. And this was it. And you know, I remember way back when we we were calling each other fellows. <laughs> I mean, this, this goes way back, and that's how it actually got started. Well, you were already a successful scholar at the time, and uh, so you saw this 
as uh, providing that oh, extra benefit. Yeah. Yes, so that you could really meet with and interact with other marketing people. Thanks for pointing out the importance of networking uh, in terms of career development. I think that's a great recommendation uh, for young scholars. Uh, but kind of related to that, uh, what do you see as the most important areas for the future uh, to direct people in terms of, of the research? Uh, in other words, what are some of the research areas where you think we really need to focus? Well, you know, I think I have to qualify an answer to that by saying, of course, I'm going to talk about the areas that I've been most involved with. And I'd say there's probably three or so areas among many. I mean, there's, there's a lot more areas, but I think research method, methodology, methodological issues will always need research. It will always need more work done. I think cross-cultural kinds of issues from the international perspective will also need additional research. And in a broader sense, I think the whole notion of the kind of research we do cross-culturally, cross-nationally, however you want to look at it, is still subject to the question of what I like to call the emic edic issue. I mean, is it culture bound or is it culture free? And we simply don't know. And there aren't enough people who care whether it is or not because there is a natural inclination for somebody to see, well, gee, there's this article, they have this particular construct measured, I'll just apply it. And it may not be applicable in that manner. You might have to modify it or do some other things. And I think that goes beyond language translation issues. Uh, so I think these are the kind of th three things that I would think need more work. But as I said, you know, there's probably 50 different things when you start getting into specific topics like brand equity and various things like that. Thanks for the uh, insights on, on new and emerging research areas, and even older research areas that we need to continue to work on. But uh, looking at advice for new faculty, uh, what would, based on all of your experience, what would you recommend that new faculty can do to uh, further their careers? I think there's about three or four things that I would issue. One. I don't know if it's foremost or not, is in your research, don't give up. Um, in effect, I am a firm believer there's a home for everything. You just got to find the right house. And uh, yes, I realize they're under great pressure to publish in certain journals. And I would certainly say you begin at the highest where you think your paper is appropriate based on topic and method and so on, you know, for example, if you weren't doing a structural model type paper, I wouldn't waste your time submitting it to JMR. I mean, just would be that because you know it's going to be probably desk rejected. Uh, they may not own up to that, but I think it, there's a very high likelihood. Uh, another thing is don't take yourself too seriously. I think you have to realize that in the grand picture, we individually are but a micro dot. And that while we have a role to play, it's not the role, it's a role. And I think that's a big difference. I would think that um, as young people, they have an opportunity to oftentimes get in on the ground level of things. And they should. I think, well, I think the other thing that I'd say, and I know there are people who do not agree with me, uh, try to do a lot of joint work. Again, it's because I have this feeling that based on my own experience, I learn something new every time when I work with somebody, uh, whether it's in the field of ethics or whatever. And, uh, I, and I realize there are people out there who when they come up through the tenure route, uh, people criticize them because they haven't done anything alone and this and that. As far as I'm concerned, who cares? It's, it's the output. 
and it's it's like I view any joint paper is each author is equally responsible not to say well I mean you know I, you only did you know I only did 10 percent and I did the good stuff and somebody else did the bad stuff that's nonsense if your name's on the paper you have to own up to it but again you know for the young doctoral students I, I, I or new faculty uh, I understand the problems they're under and the and the kind of pressures but really really don't give up I think this is the big thing keep trying I mean I had a colleague once at University of Oregon and he he didn't publish much but he he claims he had a drawer full of manuscripts because he didn't think they were good enough or something and I kept telling him come on submit them somewhere there's always somewhere uh, even if it's a conference and yes I understand a lot of schools don't give any credit for conferences and I came from one where I had colleagues who actually told younger people it would count against you if you went to a conference for a paper and yet again I would say and this is I think another thing and people will probably jump on me for this when you're at a conference yes you should go to a few sessions but the major impact you're going to get is going to be out in the hallways and at the at the receptions and at the dinners not sitting in the sessions because frankly they tend to get boring well Jerry if you were going to uh, sum up your career in a few statements and you can certainly use more than just a few statements but you know how would you sum up your accomplishments in your career? That's an interesting question, but I'm not, sh I'm not sure there's an easy answer to it. But I think you have to break it down into um, various components of, of my career. I mean, a lot of it's been spent in methodology, which is not the most exciting topic in the world. And there's a lot of people really they don't care that much about it and they don't think it's all that big of an area because you're not into a big substance kind of thing but I think that's important I think my career being internationally and this is this is something that I encourage young faculty to also do if you get the opportunity to go overseas and teach and you can do it I'd say take it because as I went for 13 straight years spent part of a year overseas in Hong Kong for a number of them in Denmark and Finland and Australia and again I learned something every time because I was dealing with local students I never went on an exchange program and I made it perfectly clear I wouldn't do it because I don't want to teach American students over in another country I want to teach their students and you learn interesting things and uh, I'll just cite this this one if I don't bore people but I used to teach sales management and I was in Hong Kong first time and I was teaching it and I got to salesman rooting which was one of the major topics I got started and then it dawned on me we're in Hong Kong what kind of a rooting problem is there in Hong Kong? I mean, <laughs> either you're in Central and you go out, or you're in Kowloon and go out. You know, that's about it. So you have to be adaptable to that kind of stuff. Or the first time I was there in, when I taught in, let's say, Turkey. This was another good example. Um, and I was teaching international marketing. And I got, and usually when I, teach basically the financial instruments I always start with so that I can get to a to let's say bank drafts and all that kind of stuff with a regular check I said now you got your regular checking account and you do this and it dawned on me huh, Turkey at that time was not a check in society it was all cash nobody knew what a check was and so you see you have to be adaptable mm -hmm. when you really get to those things um, I think by my supervision again of the doctoral students has 
has been one of the hallmarks of my career, a couple of whom or more have, you know, gone on to reasonably good careers and uh, they've done a certain amount of research and they're all good teachers. And then I think probably the last thing is looks at the teaching side. Because I took my teaching very seriously. And interestingly, I think, because some people would not would not agree with me, uh, the number one group that, and I don't know whether I should say this or not, but I will. Maybe you want to edit it out. But the <laughs> number one group that I liked teaching were doctoral students. I mean, th that was obvious. And the number two group were the undergrads. The ones I hated the most were the MBAs. <laughs> and I mean, so much that about the last five years before I retired from, from the University of Oregon, I went to my chairman and asked him, don't assign me any more MBA classes. Now that was good because a lot of people thought it was very prestigious to be teaching. But you know, there were some very good reasons, which I don't have to uh, mention here, why I felt that way. So I would think, you know, all of, all of this, and it's, it's very interesting how that works when you run into former students in the least expected places. I mean, for instance, I was in Australia, and I went to the island of, let's say, Tasmania, and out in the middle of nowhere in this lodge, I'm sitting there, and this young man comes up and says, are you Professor Albaum? Hmm. And well, he was an accountant, but he had never taken me, but he knew me, and he was teaching there at one of the universities on Tasmania. Or the uh, time, and this is when it kind of works out neat for you, we were at one airport, it might have been San Diego, we're having trouble getting in, and turns out this supervisor of, I think she was a gate supervisor, had been a former student of mine. and so. You get to go right up at the head of the line and various things like that. So, so it is interesting when you do run into former students that way. And uh, so I think that's about it. I think, uh, you know, I'm, I am sure my career hasn't been any different than most of us. Well, Jerry, since you uh, retired a few years ago and you did something a little different than some people who retired, uh, some people tend to want to just relax, uh, sip in the ocean, uh, go fishing, and those types of things. But you went to the University of New Mexico as a, a research professor after you retired and uh, accomplished quite a bit in uh, helping others with their research. Uh, what recommendations would you give to others who are kind of looking at this stage of their, their career? Let me see how I can put this. Um, Probably if I'd have had an avocation, art, furniture making, basket weaving, whatever, I might have gone that way. But I'd have gone bonkers at home and probably driven my wife nuts <laughs> if I didn't you know, do something. And, and certainly research is the, is the one thing that has intrigued me. But I would, you know, others, they just see, unfortunately, many people who retire are at a university, they don't have the option to say move to another one. See, I did because I had a former doctoral student there. And um, so they get caught in a university where they don't provide for emeritus professors. If they have an office, they shove them all in one and they, they're losing a great resource, not only for the university, but for society. Because there's a lot of us still want to keep on working. <laughs> and we like that, you know, and we are not necessarily the type that would say, oh, I do all my work at home. I mean, that's why I'm never in the office. Uh, and so I'll just keep those a little differently. But, you know, I would, I would think if you want to keep going, keep going. Uh, if you want to go somewhere and continue your career, do it. One thing I also learned a long time ago that when I went to a new country or something else, I had this, some people would call it a bad habit. I'd like to invite myself to another university there in order to give a seminar 
only for expenses if they pay my airfare down and hotel and it's amazing how many people will say yes it's also some of them say no but usually it would be a budget problem so I'd say you know just don't quit if you're interested as long as you feel you have something to contribute and and uh, even if it's working um, with younger faculty or in my case I also started up at my current position a research seminar program at, that began first in the marketing area but now for the entire uh, school where we bring in people from outside in order to give a seminar we pay their expenses and a very very modest honorary <laughs> so that's how it summed things up well Jerry thank you very much and I think everyone feels that you've been one of the most approachable scholars throughout your career helping others and uh, I know you mentioned networking all of these things have come together and we certainly uh, commend you on your on your career and it's been great talking to however, you. however I'm not sure I qualify consider myself a legend not yet <laughs> or there was a saying and I don't know how many people who are going to watch this knew the fellow there was a fellow out there he was a little older than I was named Morris Mayer and he would big big in retailing and he was down at Alabama and we were on a committee for the direct selling education foundation uh, he was the first academic on their board and I was the second and somehow we got in, somebody got into old, older, old age, and he said, nope, he says we're seasoned. <laughs> and that's, I think, a good place to end. Thank you, Jerry, for joining us uh, today, and we sincerely appreciate all of the wisdom that you've shared. Thank you, O.C.